Hi, I see, looks like a kitchen. And you are on mute. There we go. Yeah, no worries. I gotta switch her camera around. There we go. Look at you all professional in the kitchen. All Hi, right. Do you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself, Jim? Yeah, hi, I'm Jim Warner, uh, program director um, here at the Ohio State University Western Medical Center. And uh, my uh, interaction with uh, the diabetes community is I've worked uh, many, many years with uh, Colleen Reinhardt, and we've done a number of uh, a series of classes here at the Western Medical Center and continue to do so. Mm -hmm. Hi guys, I am Kelly Schmidt, also a good friend of Colleen Reinhardt, and she can't be with us here tonight. But I am a type one diabetic coming in two weeks, it'll be going on 29 years. And I am also a proud board member with JDRF and I'm a diabetic dietitian and I have my own practice here, Kelly Schmidt Wellness. And we're so excited to show you some simple but delicious blood sugar friendly recipes. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and, and get started tonight. Uh, what we have is we have a healthy Twix bar recipe, which was when I first looked at it, I thought that ah, this is gonna be kind of kind of crazy to make. But when I made it this morning, it, it, it's so easy to make and it's fun and it's absolutely delicious. And it tastes just like a Twix bar. So that's the that's the upshot. Uh, we have a few recipes that uh, Kelly uh, put together. We've got a vanilla ice cream. Uh, we've got a hummus recipe using white beans. And then we have a uh, protein uh, or banana protein pancakes that are all recipes um, for Kelly Schmidt uh, Wellness. So we're going to uh, use those tonight as well. So we're really excited to get started. I'm going to do the majority of the uh, the lion's share of the cooking and Kelly's uh, going to be our color commentary as we go throughout the evening. And we're gonna go ahead and get started. Yeah, and if anyone has questions while we're uh, you know, in action, go ahead and ask us those questions as they're top of mind because I'm happy to answer them on the list. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get started, first of all, with our Twix bar. And a couple things that we had to do to make this uh, work was, for the first recipe, and hopefully you all have a copy of the recipe in front of you. We use coconut flour, almond flour, coconut oil, and we use honey that we had to warm. So what we did is these, this is the mixture of the two flours, and then we have the coconut oil, and we have the warmed honey. We just put these in a water bath. We wanted to mix these really well together, and the reason for that is obviously the honey is a, a higher density, so it's gonna sink to the bottom. So you just want to mix these together and then pour these into the flour. And the thing that amazed me the most when I made this today was how easy this came together. Do either of you guys know where the recipes are? Um, are they getting emailed to participants or was there like a packet that went out or anything? I think the participants uh, have the recipes. I know Melissa Weber uh, uh, came up with a nice design for the recipes. And I was going to guess that they're in the app if people had downloaded the, the app. app. Okay. Otherwise, I'm not certain. Um, do we have a moderator who knows where uh, that everyone could find? Petra, do you know where the recipes are? And worst case, people can email me. I'm Kelly at kellyschmidtwellness.com, and I can email this document that we designed that looks really good. Perfect. Happy to send this out. Um, and this first recipe we're doing is going to be the most time consuming, but overall, these are really simple recipes based on real food. Um, go ahead, Jeff. Okay, so this is the, uh, the the crust for the Twix bar. So you see, we just took the, uh, the two flours, we have the oil, we have the honey, and it mixed together really, really well. Okay, and uh, there are no lumps in this like you'd find in normal flour. So what we're going to do is we have a five by seven pan and the recipe calls for a six by six pan. I couldn't find a six by six pan. <laughs> so I did the math and this is the part that uh, a lot of people might get uh, kind of hung up on. So I did the math. So I took five by seven, which is 35 inches, six by six pan is 36 square inches. So I got a five by seven because it was just close enough and it's going to work. <laughs> so, you know, don't get hung up so much on what the recipes call for get hung up on how this is going to work for you and how good it's going to taste perfect and it sounds like the recipes did get sent out previous to the demonstration perfect so, so we have our pan they can still email me if they can awesome. uh, so what we did is we have the pan here i have a layer of parchment paper on the bottom we cut this to size 
and we uh, put some spray pan in here. And we're just gonna take the crust then we're gonna sprinkle this on the bottom. And then we're gonna pat this down. And I can't show you how to bake this now, but I'm gonna show you the finished product once we get done with this. So we have a crust here and you wanna bake this for about 12 minutes. You wanna get this as, as even as you possibly can. Bake this for about 12 minutes and then you're gonna let this cool off. And may I add something? Sure. So the flour is made out of almond meal or almond flour and coconut flour. Um, I was telling Jim, I it looks so delicious and yummy, but I don't tolerate almonds. And there's so many flours available that you can use. So find a nut that, um, you know, if you have an issue, there's things like cassava flour, tapioca. Um, and I love shopping on Thrive Market. That's a really good, cheap way to get um, whole real food flours like this. Would something like chickpea flour substitute well, or would that be um, too pungent of a flavor? I think it would do okay. Almond and coconut fine. are pretty dry. Um, but I think it would work fine. Yeah, this should work fine. Um, the center or the caramel layer for the um, for this dish here is we have uh, almond butter, and I chose uh, a chunky almond butter because I wanted to get a little bit of texture. In here, we have some coconut oil, which we had to warm up. Uh, we have a little bit of vanilla extract, some maple syrup, and just a touch of sea salt that we've added to this as well. So this would be the second layer. So once this is baked, uh, we're going to pour this on top, and then we're going to freeze both of these. And then after they're frozen, we've got the third layer here. And this layer is a layer of dark chocolate. You can use the evolved eating chocolate. Uh, but I used a half cup of chocolate chips, we some coconut oil, and a touch of sea salt. So these are your three ingredients for your mise en place. So while you're looking at these, uh, Katie's going to reach around and... Uh, grab our bars. Actually, I see them right over here. So these are, what, awesome. these are what the Twix bars look like uh, when they're all done. And what you see here is we have the layers. Uh, we've got the bottom layer here, which is this crust here. We've got the second layer of the caramel, which is the almonds and the other uh, ingredients in here. And then the top layer is the chocolate with the coconut oil. Uh, I froze these for about uh, four hours, brought them out at room temperature for about 20 minutes, and then I cut them. If you try to cut them when they're too frozen, they're gonna break apart on you and the chocolate's gonna break apart. I was sprinkling a little bit of sea salt on top of these and they taste amazingly like Twix bars. Now I'm gonna bring it up real close so you guys can see all the layers there in the shot. You can get nice and close. Very beautiful, looks delicious. I can't wait to try them. And, uh, you know, the best part about this is the three of us can't leave until all of these are gone tonight. So, uh, that's, 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 yes, yeah. I was just going to say, we do not have an EpiPen. I am not doing that, Jim. We may be in a hospital right now, but okay. poor Kelly. Okay, but, but these are great. And one of the reasons they're using sea salt is it has almost a different flavor uh, to it than regular kosher salt. It's not so salty, um, but it adds a nice um texture to it and it actually opens up your taste buds. When you, you eat salt immediately, it opens up your taste buds and allows you to taste all the other flavors that you have within this dish. Kelly, do you have anything else you want to add before we move on? Yeah, as she talks about sea salt, I love bringing up the topic. Table salt and sea salt are not comparative when it comes to health. Sea salt has as many multivitamins, uh, minerals and vitamins as a multivitamin. I call it mother nature's multivitamin. So don't be afraid of sea salt. Um, it can be a very healthy thing, especially those of us with type 1 diabetes, where our body is so stressed, the sea salt can actually help our cortisol levels, our adrenals, so don't um, be shy. Should they be worried about the difference between, like, a lot of the times the sea salts don't have iodine added to them, um, so if they sub out, like, is that something that we should worry about, is lacking in iodine? No, I would not worry about that. Um, you know, I always tell clients in my practice to um, never manipulate Mother Nature. So like an egg, you want to eat the whole egg, not just the egg whites. You know, everyone gets fat phobic or calorie um, mm -hmm. too aware. But you want to eat the egg yolk and the white. And with, you know, sea salt, you know, Mother Nature didn't mess that up. And iodine, you know, you can get eat seafood to get rich, rich sources of that. But um, sea salt, king salt, and Himalayan salt, they're all in the same camp. They're all good. If you don't mind grabbing the frozen banana. Yeah, I can do that for you. I just want to make sure we get, and if anybody has any more questions that I got those for you. Are we doing ice cream next? Yes, we're going to do the uh, 
uh, vanilla ice cream, and we're going to use a banana as the base for this ice cream. Okay. Um, all of these recipes, funny enough, I have cooked in the last day or two. <laughs> so this vanilla ice cream is something often my kids ask for. You know, they want something sweet after dinner, and little do they know how healthy it is. Um, so I'll have Jen demonstrate, and I will talk through some of the health benefits of why we chose this. Okay, so we have a uh, banana here, and we chose a green tip banana that wasn't uh, really that far, so it's got a lower glycemic index uh, because it's, it didn't turn into the sugar as, as, uh, as a, a spotted or, or a dark banana would. Yeah. And um, green tip bananas also have a fiber in it called resistant starch, which can actually improve an insulin sensitivity. So I usually buy my bananas, have them sit on the counter until they just have a, you know, ripen a little bit so they're sweet. You don't want one that you can't unpeel. And then I throw them in the freezer to hold the aging of that. Okay, so we've uh, got our bananas that we're going to put into our, our blend tech. We have some soy milk, and if you want to use macadamia milk, which is uh, on the recipe, you can use that as well. Which I found at Costco. <laughs> which you found at Costco. And uh, I'm not a Costco member, but uh, I have a giant equal gift card, so that's why I picked this up. And we're going to put the sea salt to this. And we're going to put uh, some of the, uh, we said have some uh, cashews, some, have some toasted cashews to this. And I chose a nut to go in this ice cream to help with the creamy texture, but also to add fat to the overall meal, which will help blood sugar control. So if I eat a banana on plain, that could, you know, as we digest it, it will spike blood sugar. But if you add a protein and fat, it'll help buffer that curve. So instead of a, turning the blood sugar spike into a black diamond, I like to create bunny pills. Um, by how we combine ingredients. I love that analogy. I like this <laughs> like uh, uh, skiing. That's very, very nice. From Black Diamond to Bunny like, I can't believe it. Okay, so the ingredient that we have here next, Kelly can yeah. expound upon this a little bit. This is the pure paleo uh, bone broth protein, and this is a vanilla yeah. bone broth protein. So, so any protein powder will work really well, but I really like collagen bone broth powder because it's a really gentle anti-inflammatory protein and there's little to no carbohydrates with this source. So there's only four grams of carbohydrate and a whole 20 grams of protein. So overall, this helps really bring up that protein content. And if this is a meal or dessert, um, to really help with satiety and blood sugar control. So is that something with like regular protein powders that people should be, um, wary of like the carbohydrate count that's in are, are they typically higher in carbohydrates like a vegetarian type of protein powder mm -hmm. um, is higher in carbohydrates and then a lot of people buy whey protein and whey protein is actually um the most bioavailable or it, it the protein absorbs the quickest in our body compared to any other protein and with that it spikes blood sugar okay so anyone with type 1 diabetes i actually say shy away from the whey protein um, and a number of people actually don't tolerate it. So then everyone goes to the vegetarian source, but then it's higher in the carbohydrate. Yeah. And then we come down to collagen or bone broth powder. You can get, you know, this brand is my favorite design for health, but Vital Proteins is very popular. Um, but it's really gentle on the body. Okay. Um, so. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, puree our banana and our other ingredients on here. Right, I'm gonna go ahead and mute everyone so your ears don't. And it, it does often take a lot of shaking when I make it at home. Um, I don't know if you have to do it. Do you have me muted? No, you're good. Um, so I do a lot of shaking, add a little bit. Of it. There yet, so we're going to
Now, this is going to be, if you look at this, it's going to be a soft serve ice cream. If you wanted to um, puree this a little bit faster, we have yeah. a, a ninja over here or a ninja bullet that yeah. works really, really well. I bought this for a vacation trip once um, for an all inclusive resort, and I have a gluten sensitivity. So I was like, well, I want to not get sick while I'm on vacation, of course, right? And I found I can make wonderful ice cream with this little ninja bullet. It also makes great slushies using electrolyte powder in the summer, which the kids love. And of course, really good smoothie. We're going to use it for my pancake recipe shortly. But this little nugget is maybe $50 at Target and has been so helpful in eating healthier. Well, with your Target dollars, you can for $10 off and your cart meter pulls coupons. So I have one on home. I do. It's absolutely fantastic. So we have some, some top in here. We have some. Uh, we have some papitas. We have some shaved coconut, and looks like we have some uh, pecans as well. So we're going to go ahead and sprinkle this on top. And we're going to throw this into the freezer. We're going to put some chocolate on top as well. Of course. Kelly, we have a question. Can you explain why, uh, especially whey protein, is to be avoided again? Thanks. Um, whey protein absorbs very quickly in the body. So, you know, um, I think whey protein was really brought up in, in, in gyms. Personal trainers are saying, you know, right after your workout to recover muscle, you want to have whey protein because it absorbs so quickly. But when we absorb that protein so quickly, even though there's no carbohydrates, it's very insulinogenic, meaning there's insulin spike. So maybe it's something that you can experiment and see for yourselves with maybe if you have a CGM, but a lot of people do spike blood sugar wise with whey protein powder and therefore I defer people either to collagen or vegetarian based protein. Okay. Okay. So the uh, next recipe that we have is uh, Kelly's hummus. Yes. And uh, I mastered my hummus during COVID um, doing so much more cooking at home. And I found if you have a really good dip or a really good sauce, it can really make over a meal and make it that much more attractive and appealing. And I've made a number of hummus. Sorry, Kelly. So sorry. <laughs> just just, just, just <laughs> test it out with your equipment. Um, but I really like changing up the beans I use in my hummus because, you know, we don't want to eat the same thing over and over. You want to diversify what we eat so we have an abundance of different nutrition coming into our body. And I really like white beans. Um, mm -hmm. It has a slightly different taste than garbanzo. And I love nuts and seeds. So in this recipe, if you're looking at it, it has a higher amount of tahini um, or sesame butter um, to give it a nuttier taste, but I'll let you know. Okay, so uh, what we have here, we have a number of ingredients that uh, uh, you may uh, not have used before. And this one here, uh, tahini paste is a sesame paste. You can find this pretty much any store. If you can't find it at your local store, if you go to a Mediterranean store, uh, it's easy to find. Um, and once you use it, you'll find a number of ways that, uh, that you, you can use this. It's great in like salad dressing. Um, mm -hmm. It's fantastic. It's a, it acts as a binder because it's nice and thick and it's got a neutral flavor. So it, it really works well. We have a little bit of garlic in this and we chopped up the garlic a little bit earlier today and we let this sit out for uh, a little bit of time. And Kelly could expound a little bit about, about uh, why it's important to love your garlic. Yeah, I can smell yeah. it. Garlic is very medicinal. It has a lot of health properties. If you chop it, you know, the exposure to air helps the properties enhance themselves. And um, it acts more as an antifungal um, and antiviral, which is so important. And if you chop your garlic and let it sit for at least 10 minutes, it can enhance the cancer fighting properties. Um, you know, and I was, I was reading a study earlier today and it, it showed that, you know, for the common cold, if someone took garlic, garlic as a supplement, it can reduce that common cold by 70%. Um, so I love using food as medicine with type 1 diabetes and blood sugar control, but overall wellness as well. And why not? If we're using garlic, let's really enhance the value of it. So I'm going to show you a little trick here with garlic. A lot of people really don't know. A lot of people will buy garlic and, and when they try to smash down uh, the clove of garlic to get the individual cloves, this is a way to keep the cloves all in one place so you can uh, use them later. So what you want to do is take the entire garlic clove, put this into a towel, roll the towel over the top of it, and just with the palm of your hand, just press down on it. And what that'll do is that'll break up all the cloves. And if it doesn't work for you, you need a little more force, just put it on there and just...
then you've got all your cloves are separate and distinct and then you can use these as you need them and they work out really really well and then the other thing that's great about this is you get rid of all this uh, garlic skin this papery skin that you really don't want so all you do is you take the cloves that you want and you put them into a, 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 a container and keep them in your kitchen so you always have them ready for use and they're always ready to go i'm going to show you a really quick way on how you can clean the garlic to get the camera over here to the table i shall move the roboku over and there's a couple ways to do this what i like to do is lay the garlic down flat on your cutting board and with your knife you're going to take your knife and you're going to pick, place the blade away from you Okay, because if you place the blade for you and do what I'm going to do, you could cut yourself and you don't want to do that. Okay, so you're going to place your blade on top of the garlic and just kind of lay it down like that. Grab the blade and then just take the heel of your hand and you crack it. And when you crack it, all you're going to do is just take the skin right off. And then you have the garlic clove just as you need it. And it smells great. And Kelly, is that enough for it to release those? properties that we would want to let it rest after that or do we want to chop it up more? Um, the more minced the better. Okay. Okay so I'm a big garlic fan and you will be too uh, so yeah. I'm, I'm going to put two cloves of garlic in this. If you notice how I'm chopping this I keep my knuckles flat. I mean safety first in the kitchen because you want to make sure that uh, you know you're not, you know your fingers kind of flat out like this because you're going to find out uh, you're going to end up cut. And uh, you know, once you're cut in the kitchen, uh, you kind of become gun shine. You, you, you don't want to cook as much. But if you have the right tools for the job, cooking is going to be a lot more enjoyable for you, and you're going to enjoy cooking for your family a, a lot more. You know, a lot of people that I know cook with this one knife, and that's the only knife that they use for all the uh, preparations in their kitchen. I have a series of knives that I use for different things. Think of uh, knives uh, as a way of um, compared to what a carpenter might use for different jobs. Different knives are used for different jobs. You know, a carpenter wouldn't use a hammer when a wrench would work. I wouldn't use a paring knife when a French knife would work. Okay. Uh, this knife here that I have, this is a, one of the uh, knives that I would recommend for anybody's kitchen. It's called a Santuco knife. And what this is, is it has little divots on the blade. And the divots are there, so if you're slicing up a potato or something, the divots allow an air pocket. So they allow whatever it is you're slicing to fall off the blade. So they, they create that air pocket. Things just fall off. So if you're cutting zucchini or whatever kind of quickly, you can do one of these here and the things are just gonna fall off uh, as quickly as you need them. So that's um, uh, what I use. And I, and I have a couple of these. I've got a really large one that I use for, for larger foods. How do you feel about ceramic knives? Um, you know, I've used some ceramic knives, but I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of just the old school. This is the Worcester Pride knife. And I like them because, you know, they, they have the- Full tang. The full tang, the, the, which is the, the piece here. They have the, the blade that goes the whole way through the knife. They've got the metal rivets on here and, and they're solid. And what you want to do when you buy a knife is you want to put it in your hand and use your first two fingers. And if it weighs nicely and it doesn't, flop over one side or the other, then it's a well-balanced knife and it fits your hand. So many people buy knives where they get knives as, as a gift and they don't really work because they're either too big for their hands or too small for their hands. So they have a hard time cooking and they're going, you know, and they wonder why they don't like cooking is because they're not using the right uh, tools for the job. Yeah, and it's very important to take care of your knife. Um, one of the big mistakes I know most people make is putting their metal knives in the dishwasher and that then ends up uh, warping them or rusting them. So you just need to make sure you take good care of them and they will last for a long time. Yeah, and a lot of the uh, additives they use for uh, uh, the dishwashers, you know, they're really uh, acidic and they, they will uh, mark, your, uh, mark your stainless steel on here. Or they may, because of the heat, they may start to separate the uh, knife blade from the uh, uh, from the handle, and that can be a problem for mm -hmm. you as well. The next thing we're going to do is we have a lemon. A couple things that you can do to get more juice out of a lemon is if you want to put this into your microwave for about 10 or 15 seconds, that's great. Okay, If you keep it in there for 30 seconds, chances are the lemon's going to blow up, Okay, which is great. <laughs> because it's gonna clean all that stuff on top of your microwave that you've been meaning to get to. 
and it'll also make your microwave smell lemony fresh, but you will lose your lemon. So my <laughs> recommendation is put it in there for about 10 or 15 seconds, let it get warm. Or if you don't have a microwave available, what you want to do is just take this and roll this on your cutting board. When you roll this on your cutting board, two things are happening. The warmth of your hand is releasing some of the juice from the lemon sacks that are in here. And it's also making the lemon softer. So when you squeeze it, the juice is gonna come out a lot faster. So this is ready to go. And actually, if you were here on the room, you can smell some of that lemon oil come off. This lemon okay. smells absolutely fantastic. So we're gonna go ahead and cut our lemon directly in half. And you can see uh, just by the fact that we uh, squeeze this a little bit, it's going to um, release the juice a lot faster. Than we put in the so we have our cannellini beans here that we're going to add to our Roboku. Roboku is just a brand for a food processor, so you can do it in that. You can also do it in a blender. And, um, most of the ingredients for this recipe here, um, I found the best prices and best quality from Trader Joe's, especially the tahini one. Got our beans. We're going to add our tahini to this. We're going to add our garlic. And if you don't have tahini or if you want to be like, looking to find it, you can use any nut butter. Yeah, peanut butter works well, but I'd recommend getting freshly ground peanut butter because peanut butter that you find like Jif or Skippy tends to have a lot of sugar uh, in, it, in it as it's being processed. Uh, with the lemon juice, I have gloves on. If you squeeze a lemon into your hand, uh, and you have a cut in your hand, you're gonna find out real fast where it is when you squeeze this lemon juice in here. Uh, the recipe calls for, I believe, two ounces of lemon juice and a medium to large sized lemon, if squeezed properly, is gonna give you that. And I'm squeezing this through my fingers and I'm catching the seeds in my hand, which you don't want in your hummus because number one, they don't puree very well. Uh, number two, uh, they taste pretty bad. You don't want lemons in your fingers if you're pricking them a lot. Yeah. Yeah. We do. <laughs> Which happens a lot when you're working in the kitchen and, and while you're doing food. We also have candy dandy mesh strainers. They do have mesh strainers, <laughs> but you know, I'm kind of an old school guy. And uh, so I'll, I'll go ahead and put these through my fingers. Um, this recipe I actually used tonight. And what I do now that the weather is kind of colder, it's the Indian summer right now. But I will just get sheet pans out of my kitchen and fill it with all kinds of vegetables and roasted vegetables. And then for lunch, I'll put all the roasted vegetables in a bowl, reheat it, and then top it with the tomatoes and make some leftover protein I have. But that's been my go to lunch for the last all of weeks. So someone said, um, so beans instead of chickpeas again, why? Just a different nutrition profile, just a very, mm -hmm. you can do chickpeas. And chickpeas are just a bean, I guess we should yeah. clarify. They are a bean, yes. just like the white beans. It's just, as yeah. Kelly said, it's If different. you wanted to use black beans, you can use black beans. If you yeah. wanted to use um, edamame and make some green hummus, you can use edamame. You can even use lentil. Mm -hmm. It's just really kind of the complex carb ratio. And then, do you happen to know offhand how many carbs are? Per, let's say, offhand, probably two tablespoons. Uh, Grams for this whole dish. So we're going to add some olive oil to this. You said for how much? Ten grams. Two, two, two tablespoons. Half a cup or a fourth a cup, right? Um, so there's four tablespoons and a quarter cup. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you there. Um, so a half a cup would be about twenty-eight grams. So a fourth a cup would be fifteen grams. Okay. Being okay. type one diabetic, you memorize the labels and carb counts. Yeah. <laughs> I just memorize uh, quantities and portions. Yes. Four tablespoons, quarter cup. Teamwork makes the dream work. Right. But overall, yes, again, it doesn't matter what bean it is. I just found I really like white beans and the flavor. And um, they're kind of creamier. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I use a lot of chickpea pasta. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to rotate the foods that my family was eating. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to add some olive oil to this. And we're adding extra virgin olive oil. And the reason we use extra virgin olive oil, it is the actual first press of the olive. So what that means is you are getting, you know, the olive oil should be a little bit green when you press it because you're getting a lot of the nutrients from the first press of the olive. As it goes down to, uh, from extra virgin to virgin to pure, what they do is they use a lot of different tactics, maybe steam pressure, or they use just uh, pressure on the olive to produce the uh, uh, olive oil. And it tends to get a little more bitter the cheaper the oil is. 
And one thing on oils, um, you know, if you guys were like, Dietitian Kelly, what's one tip to walk away with to improve my health? It would be to remove vegetable oils from your diet. And most hummuses, you know, even the ones we find at Whole Foods will be made with canola oil. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just because vegetable oil has a word vegetable in it, it doesn't mean it's healthy. It's like a veggie chip. Mm -hmm. you know, There's a local same. one called Oasis. It's uh, actually Ohio made and they, uh, it, Use oil? there's no oil. Oh, there, oh, it must be a, a vegan, um, but that's great. That's yeah, great. Just, but overall, using olive oil is just so much more nutritious than the vegetable oils. And, you know, there's one stat, it's one tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil. It adds anti-inflammatory as a baby aspirin. Again, using food as medicine. And that's one big reason I started making my own hummus because all the hummuses out there were using, you know, cheap mm -hmm. oils to make a profit. Yeah, and, and whenever you see blended oil where it says a blend of olive oil, and it's usually used in a cheaper oil. It's, it's uh, sometimes that they, they, they use uh, it's called a rapeseed oil. Yeah, um, which has which a great is, smoke which, point, right? Which is also a canola high oil. Point, so that's what most high people smoke know. point. And canola oil, there really is no canola plant. <laughs> no. Canola oil really stands for Canadian oil low acid. Okay, so when you buy canola oil, you are buying something that some policy wonk in an office somewhere in Canada said. We're going to call it canola and we're going to sell this to people. Well, it's just an abbreviation for what that oil is. It doesn't make it any better. It uh, doesn't make it any more expensive. It just makes it canola oil. So okay. we're going to go ahead and put this on mute for a hot second while we turn on the Roboku. Another study talking about vegetable oils, and it found that consuming vegetable oils can actually stimulate our cravings. Um, it's a it's a foreign ingredient to our body, so try to avoid it the best you can. And as you're making this recipe, another tip: you can add a little water if you want your hummus fluffier. I'm sure you can do that. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to add a little bit of uh, roasted cumin to this. Cumin adds a little bit of a Mediterranean flair to the dish. So we're going to put this in here. And uh, we have about a half a tablespoon in here. And as Kelly said, we're gonna add a little little spot of water in here to bring that up. And we're gonna put you back on mute because it's gonna be really noisy. So Thank you, Jen. <laughs> So the best part about this is that we're using the machinery that we have here, that the, uh, the kitchen tools uh, to do the job. And this smells great just as it is. Uh, when we finish this off, I actually have a platter that uh, we're gonna use and it has some raw vegetables on here. And we have some celery sticks and carrot sticks and we have some broccoli florets. You want to use uh, peppers, any kind of a fresh vegetable would work really, really well uh, for the hummus. So we're going to go ahead and uh, take the blade out of the Roboku. And you want to really be careful because most of the time these blades are very, very sharp. I'm sorry. I did miss a question earlier. Someone asked, are the beans rinsed? And then can you yeah. speak to why? Yes, you would. Or Absolutely. We rinse them for two reasons. Number one, uh, when they sit in the can, they tend to get a little bit murky. Uh, and, and kind of uh, uh, the liquid that gets in there kind of gets murky. Plus, there's a little bit of sodium uh, in there, so you want to rinse them to get rid of that murkiness and get rid of the sodium as well. Mm -hmm. I agree. And also, I also do this as a precaution to, you know, wash off any of the, the lining of the can that would be put on the food. Um, if there's any moms or dads out there looking at this recipe, watching us today, who may be trying to influence our kids to eat more vegetables, a fun trick I sometimes use is I'll get out a cupcake tray and fill the cupcake tray with some, you know, certain berries and then some vegetables and then maybe one of the cupcakes would be hummus and then kind of present it to the kids so they can choose and pick which thing they want to eat versus saying, you know, Billy Bob, eat your vegetables and this and that, but give them that independence and um, inspiration to choose what they most want. Okay, so we have the, uh, the platter here. So we've got the carrot sticks, the uh, celery, uh, the broccoli, we have the hummus. And I'm gonna sprinkle some black sesame seeds on here just for a little bit of a contrast. I don't think they make black tahini paste. I'm not sure that uh, yeah, black hummus would, uh, would uh, 
<laughs> by the time you added it, it would look like the gray stuff from Beauty and the Beast. Yeah, Try the gray it, stuff. It, it it's delicious. Very I'm going to hit this with a little bit of a touch of olive oil. Absolutely. Just because olive oil is fantastic. Okay, and uh, we put a little bit of sea salt on here as well. But there you have your hummus platter. This is about all you need. I don't know how much, uh, what the uh, nutrient. Uh, you know how much. Uh, there's there's probably about four ounces of hummus on the plate right here. I would say that plate's probably close to 30 to 40 grams of carbs. Okay. Um, so th this is something that you can eat while you're watching a football game. Take your time with food. One thing that, that you know, we, we talk to a lot of people about food, and one of the things that we tell them is that food should be something that should be enjoyed. Eating uh, your, your meals should not be just one more thing that you do during the day. So many people rush through life saying, I've got to eat breakfast, I've got to eat lunch, I've got to eat dinner. So they really don't have a, they have an unhealthy relationship with food. And so what we really try to promote is enjoy your food, take your time, enjoy the flavors, enjoy the aromas uh, with your food and enjoy cooking the food. You're going to enjoy it um, that much more. You're going to spend more time preparing the food at home and you're going to find out that you're going to eat better because um, your body's going to, going to thank you for it. Yeah. Um, another thing I was going to add with, you know, this hummus that has more nut butter or tahini in it compared to other hummuses, and then we're eating it with vegetables. So there's a lot of fiber here. There's a lot of healthy fat, and there's some protein from the beans. And the way we would dose our insulin would be very different than, again, if we were eating just a plain piece of fruit. So I may sit down to this meal and then take my bolus of insulin first having that pre bolus period if I were eating something like fruit. Um, just a little bit. Any questions? Um, yes, we do have a question. Type actually. one insulin meals, eating snacks. Um, are walnut oil, avocado oil suitable replacements? Yes, I love using avocado oil, especially at high heat. Um, avocado oil also picks up the flavor of whatever I'm cooking a lot. So every time I do those sheet pans of just roasting all kinds of vegetables, it's always avocado. Would it be better to add just the regular avocado to the hummus versus the oil? What would you recommend? I wouldn't. I think the oil really needs to help and it would disperse yeah. a lot better. Um, you know, I like to think you're know, using a whole unprocessed, unprocessed food, but I think the, the oil is a better shot. And I think we have one more question one right question. now. Can you sub other spices for the cumin, like smoked paprika? Oh, absolutely. Uh, smoked paprika, I would use uh, turmeric. Turmeric is getting a lot of press right now. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Being so anti-inflammatory. So anti-inflammatory. And, and I use it, actually, I um, take a dish at home, and my wife had this other night for dinner. And, and you might think it sounds kind of silly, but we had a head of cauliflower for dinner. Took a head of cauliflower. Cut it in half, cut it in quarters, cut out the stems, then cut each piece flat. Uh, rubbed in a little bit of olive oil, some salt, pepper, and then we roasted that in about a 450 degree oven. Uh, but before we set it in the oven, we put some turmeric powder on yeah. top of that, and it's really yellow. And then uh, we brought it out, we sprinkled some lemon juice, so we put some Parmesan Reggiano cheese on top of that. And that was our meal. We were, we were filled. Awesome. Uh, we had a tall glass of water with that, so we took all of the uh, the fiber that was in the cauliflower and it expanded our stomach, so we felt full, and it was a vegetarian, a completely a, a vegetable-based meal. So it was actually fantastic, and uh, for me to get my wife to do that after 32 years is a, is a testament to my patience, so thank you. <laughs> and, and yeah, I think the original recipe, I don't even know if it has cumin in it. Um, I try to keep my my recipe so simple and to really enjoy the simplicity of the ingredients. Like I love tasting that tahini and the hummus. You know, my sister-in-law, she's like, every gathering, she's like, are you going to bring your hummus? And she's like, it just has this nutty flavor and it's just, it's amazing and simple. Okay, so the next ingredient or the next recipe that we have, we have a, a banana protein pancakes, okay? So we have a regular pancake griddle here and we're going to use Kelly's ninja which i have one of these at home and the, the great thing about ninjas versus a traditional blender is the ninjas have a wider bottom and if you look at the most traditional blenders everything goes down to a narrow point so it's really difficult for the food to get pureed the whole way up through because you have that at the bottom and it creates kind of a hole and it doesn't all the way drop to the bottom this food here with the wider bottom it, it does a great great job so we're going to go ahead and mix everything that we have here uh, with the pancakes instead of using the bowl. But if you don't have a ninja, 
I'll show you. I'll, 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 I'll Any of the hand that. blenders will work. You know, I have a neutral bullet, and I really like that too. But I know like other people have. Uh, we have a tool here that works well. You can kind of mash this down as well. But when we put it in here uh, in the Ninja, it actually curries a lot better, so it has more of a pancake sort of texture to yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Um, and this recipe is always a go-to in our house, especially I was coaching my son's soccer team and it was like, get home from school, get ready for soccer. We need, you know, quick, healthy, um, satisfying, filling meal. So I would, I'd be like banana pancakes tonight. And again, it's simple ingredients. The eggs have really healthy fat, good protein. And I add the collagen again. Um, but this is a breakfast. This is a, a snack would be one of a big snack and then a go-to dinner for something quick. And the thing is, that's nice about these, and, and I'm thinking ahead of these before I, I I see it come out. If you want to spread some nut butter on top of this, I'm a big oh, fan yeah. of, of bananas and peanut butter as they, as they go together. So we've got about five minutes, so we're going to go ahead and hurry up. We've got the uh, green tip banana. And we're gonna... oh, I guess we eat a lot of bananas in my house. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my <well. friends> eat. <laughs> and and uh, you will too someday, everybody <laughs> out there. So we're just going to take the banana. Um, also... If this is a breakfast, um, having type 1 diabetes, it is extremely beneficial to have a higher protein breakfast. You know, there's study out of, studies out of the University of Missouri and Harvard research showing if we have at least 20 to 30 grams of protein for our first meal of the day, it can help reduce snacking, total, total calories for the day, cravings, and overall better blood sugar control. And I tell my clients, you know, look at the palm of your hand. The, the thickness and width of your palm is about 20 to 25 grams of protein per meal. And this is the perfect portion of a protein I should have at each meal. You know, the average American, um, <laughs> you want me to cut me off? The, the <laughs> average American um, eats three times as much protein at dinner, but we really need to spread that out throughout the day. You know, we, that's very traditional to have just oatmeal. It's very traditional just to have cereal. And again, that's why I love this collagen protein because it's a quick add of protein that's tasty, anti-inflammatory, and um, good for blood sugar control. Okay, so we've got our, our banana, we've got our eggs, we've got our cinnamon, we've got our uh, uh, protein powder in there. So we're going to put this in <laughs> Thanks. So we're going to go ahead and open this up. And you can make this one recipe a giant pancake, which I've gotten pretty good at flipping. Um, <laughs> or you can make it. I'm not going to try that tonight. Uh, <laughs> so I'm going to make a couple smaller ones. We're going to put a little bit of butter in, in the pan. You could use uh, some coconut oil if you wanted. We have this set at about 300 degrees, 325. And again, I recommend butter, not margarine. Go into that, you know, avoiding vegetable oil. So you don't want to use dairy. You Oil or oil. So we've got these around here. I've got a two ounce ladle. We're going to go ahead and pour the pancake mix into a two ounce ladle. We're going to lay this down. It's a very thin batter um, and it's really easy if you want to thicken it up with a tablespoon of the coconut oil or excuse me, coconut flour or almond flour. But again, I keep into the basics of the recipe we're presenting. Okay, so I'm going to bring this up to about 350, and you'll know when it's time to flip these. Whenever you see the pancakes start to bubble up, uh, whenever you see the bubbles start coming through uh, the bottom, then it's going to tell you uh, that it's ready to flip. One of the reasons that I use the uh, the ladle is I wanted to get the right portion size here. You, you know, put a big pancake in there, you're really not sure you know what, what your carb count is or your calorie count. So uh, something like this, um, uh, you, you know, uh, you can put four in the griddle if you certainly wanted to. Uh, and you can see here how they're starting to cook. If you look around the edges here, they're starting to turn a little bit opaque. And as they do that, uh, they're going to start to rise just a little bit, but not too much. Uh, there isn't any leavening agent in these pancakes uh, like you'd find like baking powder or baking soda. You've got the leavening agent of the eggs that is actually uh, cooking the, uh, the bananas together. I imagine when we flip these over, they're going to brown off uh, really, really nicely from the sugar from the banana. And uh, they're going to taste great because you've got the banana, you've got the cinnamon in here, and uh, you've got the um, all the makings of a, of a really nice breakfast. Then you it can smells see, really good. And you can see this one here, how it's starting to turn just a little bit kind of opaque where it's starting to dry out a little bit. Once we, this section here starts to dry out, that tells me 
that the heat from the bottom of the pan has gone up about halfway through the pancake. So when the heat's gone up halfway through, I'm going to flip it over so that he can go up through the second half of the pancake. So this one's just about ready here. If you flip them when they're too early, uh, it's going to make a mess and you don't want to do that. Uh, if you wanted to make little individual silver dollar pancakes, you could do that um, as well. If you wanted to make this into a crepe, yeah. what you could do is make a really thin layer on this, flip it over, and then uh, pull it out, let it cool off, and then you could put some uh, almond butter in there, maybe some different nuts, kind of roll it up and cut it into little small pieces. And that'd be really, really fun. This one here is ready to go. You can see how this is starting to dry out a little bit. So we've got our number one pancake here and they merge together, which we don't want. So we're gonna move those apart. I take the second one here, we're gonna flip it over. Okay. And we've got two great looking pancakes. And if you were in the room, you would smell these wonderful pancakes coming up. These are our fan favorites. They're always like, and throwing on different nut butters, some good fairy gold butter. So feeling so satisfying. Yes, so this is about ready to go. And we have a uh, little nut butter over here. No, we don't. We don't have chocolate. We can take chocolate over there. Yeah, I do chocolate for sure. Okay, well, yeah. we have some of the chocolate left here for our topping. So, in the spirit of improvisation in the kitchen, I have some of this chocolate left over that was going to be the topping uh, for the uh, Twix bar. We're going to use that as the syrup. And this is a, 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 a lower fat chocolate, um, a lower sugar chocolate. That's going to be great on these pancakes because chocolate and bananas go together amazingly well. All right, Elvis. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we're just going to take this and then just to make this fun, we're going to do one of these numbers oh, here. Oh, that's awesome. And this, was, and this is great for kids to do because this gives kids an opportunity to spend time in the kitchen. And they can make a Jackson Pollock original with their food, which they can't do in school because in school they're taught to go and color within the lines. When you're in the kitchen, you color outside of the lines. And that's one of the great things we do. We're going to bring the items over here and kind of show you everything that we prepared for you tonight. Here's your screen. It's in the freezer there. Can you grab it? Okay, so in, uh, in less than 45 minutes, we come up with the uh, banana pancakes, which look fantastic. They're gonna be gone as soon as the camera's off. They'll be gone in about <laughs> five minutes. Uh, we've got our white bean hummus that looks great. And you've got a, a plethora of vegetables on there. And you can use any kind of vegetables that you like. We've got our Twix bars, uh, with a little bit of sea salt. And then we've got our uh, banana ice cream and it froze up really, really nicely. So it's kind of like a custard at this point in time. Lovely. And then we have everything on here. So anybody have any questions? Uh, everyone says, looks amazing, yum. Oh my goodness, that food looks so good. Uh, what is the brand of vanilla collagen peptides that was used? The one that I had used, again, is Designs for Health. Um, and it's a pharmaceutical, a pharmaceutical grade supplement company, but you can find this on Amazon um, or I can source it through me. Is there, if anyone was looking for like a vegetarian alternative, is there like a vegetarian alternative that you would recommend? Yeah, I would recommend, you know, a pea protein Okay, would be what I would recommend. There's a lot of rice protein powders out there, mm -hmm. um, but rice has been tested uh, time and time again. I don't know if you've heard this, but there's a lot of arsenic in rice. So especially the protein powders, mm -hmm. so I would lean towards the pea protein. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, we're going to sit here and we're going to enjoy a Twix bar <laughs> while we sign off. And we want to thank you very much for tuning in tonight. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can reach out to uh, uh, Melissa Weber or yeah. anybody else at uh, JDRF. Yeah, so, uh, actually, I missed one question earlier. It says, we are allergic to tree nuts. Any replacement suggestions? I would assume they were meaning for um, the... Um, Twix bars, or also maybe even for the banana thing. Well, well if you can eat ground nuts, um, you know, peanuts, uh, those would be. Or I'd even use sun food. butter. I was going to say sun butter to heat. That should work pretty well. Lovely. And then for flowers, you can use cassava to avoid them. 
Thank you guys. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.